So in July, we sent in the, f the first round to be sequenced, and we got the results from that sequencing in September, and we uploaded it to GEDmatch, as Colleen said. We had a number of matches. They were all what we would call third cousins, fourth cousins, etc. And just so you understand, a DNA match really is an individual who's tested with a company like Ancestry and uploaded their DNA results to GEDmatch. They share some percentage of DNA with you. It could be a very small amount, but we call them matches because they have some significant shared ancestry with you. We worked on those results for uh, several months through December, and we by then had a team of about 19 volunteers who put in hundreds of hours. I think all told before we solved this case, we probably put in about 1,500 hours um, over, the, over the months. We also had some assistance from a few of the matches themselves who we reached out to very carefully who ended up being very helpful, giving us their own family trees and pointing us to branches that we could further investigate there. In December, we were feeling frustrated that, first of all, there were, the matches were pretty distant and we weren't finding any good strong leads to lead us to, to our John Doe. Um, so we decided at that point to take that last little bit of DNA extract and do a second round of sequencing on it. This was a gamble because that's all that was left, but our feeling was that it's as if you have a very low resolution image and you don't have enough dots per inch to make out the face in that image you take a second photograph and you have a different set of dots and it's still kind of hard to figure out the image. But we did get a couple of other matches and a little bit more confidence in our data. And ultimately in January, actually February, our bioinformatics expert combined those two files for us and he delivered those new files on March 5th. If you think about two low resolution photographs, if you were to overlay them, those dots per inch would kind of fill in the gaps and you might start seeing a face that you couldn't see on the individual images. And that's exactly what happened. On March 5th, we had a brand new third cousin-ish match that hadn't been on either of the other lists. And one of our volunteers uh, started working the family tree because most of these matches don't come with a family tree. We have to figure them out. She immediately recognized one of the grandparents' names as Schreiber because Schreiber was already in the tree that we had been building from all the other matches. And in fact, on the right side, on the tree in the right side, you'll see match number two, who was that brand new match, who connected with a Schreiber that was already in our tree. And to our amazement, that Schreiber, Alpha Schreiber, was actually married, married to a Nichols. Now we had a match from early in, in October, match one on the left side, that was Chandler, as we called him, his closest match at the time. We figured probably a third cousin, which means sharing great, great grandparents. We had built her tree out as extensively as we could, back five generations, and then forward all those descendants of which people have hundreds. But we had particularly focused on any time any time a name Nichols came up, we were particularly interested in those uh, branches. And sure enough, this new match allowed us to join those two families. And that's the kind of sweet spot in genetic genealogy that you look for. Matches that combine two trees of other matches. And that led us to Alpha and Silas Nichols, who were both already in the tree, along with all four sons. So Robert Nichols had actually been sitting in our tree since October, but we had not pursued those sons because there were hundreds and hundreds of other uh, more leads that were at least as good. In fact, we were concentrating on the Oklahoma area at the time. Um, so we went back to those four sons and discovered three of them had death dates, so we ruled them out. But the fourth one, who was a little bit older than we thought Joseph Newton Chandler was, but within the age range, he had no death date. 
Another volunteer found a birth certificate for him and noticed that the address was 1823 Center Street. That's where he was born. That's where the family lived for decades after that. They're on every census report after that. And one of our volunteers said, hey, isn't that the same address as he put on the rental agreement for his sister that didn't exist? So in fact, when people steal an identity or change their name and make up a fictitious life, they often say, use the same street address that they can remember easily, and they just change the city. So when we compared those two documents, which I think are over here, I can't see, um, we, we said, bingo, we've got him. He, the DNA fit, the birth date fit, the fact that with our research at 3 and 4 in the morning, we couldn't find anything about him past 1965, certainly nothing after 1978. But with the 1823 Center Street, we really felt like we had, uh, we had solved the case.